It was early August 1964. The St. Louis Cardinals, who would eventually win the World Series, were eight games out of first place. Their fans were not confident of the future. The U.S. economy had recently set a new record for growth and expansion. Individual income was up and inflation was under control. Yet, portions of the American society were not doing well. With the November U.S. presidential elections approaching, Republicans had already made U.S. Senator Barry Goldwater their nominee, and at the end of August, the Democrats would hold their own convention at which they would nominate Lyndon Baines Johnson. And throughout America, on those hot August nights, people were listening and dancing to the top song on the charts, The Beatles' Hard Day's Night. It was certainly a hard day's night for the sailors on ships in the South China Sea. Just hours earlier, in the late evening of August 4th, there had been a perceived North Vietnamese attack on USS Maddox and USS Turner Joy, and in the early morning hours of August 5th, the attack seemed to be over. Authorities in Washington, D.C. were considering a short, sharp blow to North Vietnam. The Joint Chiefs of Staff, JCS, had already alerted fleet units to get ready to conduct possible strikes on North Vietnam the first of what would eventually become the Vietnam War. The USS Ticonderoga, Tycho, on patrol at Yankee Station and already conducting Yankee team missions over Laos, had provided aircraft to find and destroy the hostile patrol boats that night, but never spotted any on the dark, stormy seas. The USS Constellation, Connie, having gotten underway from Hong Kong shortly after dawn on August 4th and speeding south, had also provided aircraft to support the Maddox and Turner Joy, and they had not seen any patrol boats either. As of yet, there were no surface-to-air missiles in North Vietnam, and although the fledgling North Vietnamese Air Force had MiG-17 fighter pilots in training, they and their aircraft were in China. If there was to be a fight on August 5th, it would be the most permissive environment the American pilots would ever face over North Vietnam. And even then, the AAA would be deadly. As SYNCPAC and Task Force 77 tried to sort out what had actually happened on the night of August 4th, they were constantly hounded by Washington, D.C. for updates and assurances. The communications between the SYNCPAC shore facilities and the units at sea were as good as could be expected in the mid-1960s, which means not great. But the communications between SYNCPAC and Washington, D.C. were robust which allowed Washington, D.C. to put relentless pressure on SYNCPAC decision makers. Both aircraft carriers had been launching aircraft through the night of August 4th and into the early morning hours of August 5th. Their mission, to find the elusive hostile patrol boats or any sign of wreckage. A little after four in the morning, the carriers received the official preparatory order that was specific they were to start preparing strikes on several North Vietnamese patrol boat bases and notably their major store of fuel at Vin. Commander Jim Stockdale, commanding officer of VF-51 and F-8 Crusader Squadron, was deep in sleep on Tycho after having flown a mission late into the night supporting Maddox and Turner Joy. In the darkness, he was rousted from his sleep. The junior officer of the deck had been sent by the ship's captain to wake the tired aviator. As Stockdale cleared his head, he asked why he had been woken from his sleep. He was told that he was to lead the strike on the priority target, part of a reprisal strike on North Vietnam. Stockdale said, reprisal for what? While airborne the night before, he had seen no trace of hostile boats, but he had his orders and quickly got to work. Elsewhere, on Tycho and Connie, the aviators were being rousted from their sleep to start preparing for their missions. The ordnance men were already building up the bombs, and maintainers were getting the aircraft ready. Although no execute order had yet been received, the strike priorities, targets, and rules of engagement had been given. It would be an all-Navy show. The JCS tasking, in the clipped language used in messages, stated, 
JCS have directed SyncPAC to conduct one-time maximum effort CVA airstrikes against Watau patrol craft and PT boats at bases in NVN and a supporting POL facility. The target locations for Connie's Air Wing would be Port Walut, very close to the Chinese border, Hongay, and Lok Chow, the Songma estuary. Pico's Air Wing would have Han Mei, the Vin Petroleum Storage Complex, to include nearby Fukloi PT Base and Kuang K. Of all targets, the large store of petroleum products at Vin was to be utterly destroyed. It would be the highest priority target. At 627 local, JCS transmitted the message the aviators had been waiting for, the execute order. The strikes were on. The tactics planned by the two air wings varied considerably. In retrospect, it would seem the pilots had lost much of the hard-won insight from the Korean War, that of staying above the heart of the AAA envelope and limiting the number of passes on a well-defended target. For Connie's strikes, which were against boats in their harbor facilities, there was the problem that the position of the targeted boats would not be known until the strike had arrived on scene in the target area. So they planned for continuous flak suppression against AAA by A-4s with rockets and strafing, while A-1s would make multiple passes over targets. F-4s would be present as TARCAP, Target Combat Air Patrol. Conversely, for Tycho's strike on the Vin Petroleum Complex, it was a known fixed target. Tycho's air wing planned a brief but massive flak suppression by F-8s and A-4s, while A-1s made a single strike pass. The Tycho fighters, which were able to carry air-to-air missiles, would carry none that day. Jim Stockdale, the strike lead, expected no air-to-air threat on August 5th. The air threat would come later, but not today. Strike plans for the two carriers showed similarities. Both Tycho and Connie would do sequential launches of strike groups, which would launch A1s first, then, after a delay, the strike package jets would be launched. This would give the slower A1s a head start, with the faster jets catching up from behind just before arriving at the target. In all cases, A1s, although slower than their jet counterparts, were the prime strike aircraft in view of their ability to carry heavy loads of ordnance, as well as their superb delivery capabilities. Of note, the F4s, which the smaller Tycho did not have, would participate, but not play a leading role in these strikes. In the months and years ahead, that would change, and the Phantom would become, for many, the iconic naval aircraft of the war. The original mission tasking from JCS stated a 0700 strike execution time was desired. That was highly optimistic and unrealistically early for a multi-carrier strike on five targets for a task force that had done no actual strikes on that deployment. Connie needed to close the intended launch area yet also recover aircraft that had been supporting the DeSoto mission and prepare for the strikes. They stated the recommended TOT, or time on target, would be 1545. Tycho also needed to recover aircraft and prepare for the strikes, but had the advantage of already being in the desired launch area. Tycho stated they could make a 1315 strike. In the end, their common bosses, Carrier Task Force 77 and 7th Fleet, failed to ensure a common TOT. As would be later seen, this time differential, among other issues, would cause greater risk for the Connie crews that made the later strikes. At 1049, the first strike aircraft launched, A-1s from Tycho. Having very long endurance, they were launched early and told to hold overhead the carrier in order to clear the flight deck for returning aircraft. Other crews would soon be launching. As strike preparations were taking place, President Johnson and Secretary of Defense McNamara had been wringing their hands, wanting the strikes to happen as soon as possible in order to allow the President to make a live announcement on television during primetime viewing. Historical records and recorded conversations show that Johnson and McNamara finally convinced themselves that it would be okay to announce the strikes to world television before the strike aircraft even pushed towards their targets. The president went on TV shortly after 11.30 p.m. D.C. time. Air action is now in execution against gunboats 
and certain supporting facilities in North Vietnam which have been used in these hostile operations. So in an unbelievable demonstration of lack of regard for those in harm's way, exhibiting at best a sophomore grasp of the nature of war, LBJ specified the targets to be hit on world television before the strike aircraft had even pushed from overhead the carriers. Such knowledge, of course, being of great benefit to the North Vietnamese military. Thus, at the very start of the Vietnam War, LBJ and McNamara allowed an unnecessary and completely self-imposed deadline, which was good for them politically, to lead them into faulty decision-making and to announce the strike before it had occurred. Such acts would be representative of their flawed decision-making processes in the years ahead. Although some air crew were told of the President's grave error in alerting the North Vietnamese, the aviators focused on what they were responsible for. Their job was to execute the orders given them, even at the great risk to themselves, and that they did. Minutes after the President's televised announcement, the first strike aircraft, A-1s holding over Tycho and led by Commander Lee McAdams, turned towards their now-alerted targets. At 1200, as Connie's air crew were getting ready to man their jets, Port Walut was taken off the strike list. So in a last-minute shuffle, the Port Walut assigned aircraft were tasked to support the Hange strike. At 1220, Tycho finished launching eight F-8s and eight A-4s, the rest of the VIN strike package, and the aircraft turned northwest to overtake their A-1 counterparts. Among the element leads were Commander Jim Stockdale and Commander Wes McDonald. Less than 15 minutes later, the Tycho strike package were Quang Key, six F-8s, launched and headed northwest. At 1300, with the Tycho strike packages still en route, the Connie now launched eight A-1s for an early start on Hongye and Lok Chow. Among those aircraft was a Sky Raider piloted by Lieutenant J.G. Richard Sather. Then, at 1315, two hours after the President's address, the Rubicon was crossed. Tycho's F-8 strike package rolled in on Quang K. The next target to be hit would be the primary one of the day, one in which a very high level of damage was required, the petroleum storage facility at Vin. The Vin strike package had three key elements. Day ones coming in from the south would make a single pass over the petroleum storage facility, hitting it with a mix of Mark 81 and Mark 83 bombs. Simultaneously, two divisions of A-4s would also come from the south, taking on the AAA guns with 2.75-inch rockets and 20-millimeter rounds. And from the north, also at the same time, two divisions of F-8s would hit AAA guns with Zuni rockets and 20-millimeter. After a mere two minutes in the Vin target area, the petroleum storage facility was largely destroyed. Flames were reaching 5,000 feet, smoke up to 14,000. Then, like a fast-moving storm of destruction, the Tycho strike package turned towards Phuc Loi, just a few miles away, and raced to continue their reign of destruction, but now on patrol boats and their support facilities. At 1430, Connie launched the jet elements of the Hong Gay and Lok Chow strikes. The packages included Phantoms for Tarcap, and in the strike groups were John Nicholson and Everett Alvarez. 45 minutes later, the Connie Lok Chow strike element reached its target, the Song Ma Estuary. The North Vietnam crews in the area, having had ample time to be alerted by President Johnson's speech nearly three hours prior, and the earlier strikes to the south, were ready for them. The strike elements followed their plan, making multiple low passes over the target area. Lieutenant J.G. Richard Sather, pilot of an A-1 Sky Raider, call sign Electron 505, was shot down on his third pass over the target. Hit by anti-aircraft fire, he flew into the water directly between two patrol boats two miles offshore. No parachute was seen and no emergency signal detected. He was the first naval airman killed in the war. Ten minutes later, at 1540, the other Connie strike package reached its target, Hange. The North Vietnam crews in the area were also ready. While making a second pass over the target in his Skyhawk, Lieutenant J.G. Everett Alvarez, call sign Warpaint 411, was hit by a barrage of anti-aircraft fire 
as he was exiting the target area 100 feet off the deck. At low altitude, yet heading towards the open water of the Tonkin Gulf, the aircraft was coming apart and filling with smoke. As he headed for the water, Alvarez tried to control the aircraft, but it would not be. He radioed a terse, I'll see you guys later, and ejected at very low altitude. In the chute, for a mere one to two seconds, he hit the water a couple hundred feet off the coast. He would see his friends later, but it would be a very, very long time. He was to become the first airman to become a prisoner of the North Vietnamese. The strikes were not yet complete. At 1600, Tycho launched two more strike elements. The first and larger of the two was for a restrike on Vin to ensure maximum destruction of the petroleum storage facility. A two-plane Skyhawk section was also launched, their mission to find and destroy any hostile craft in the vicinity of Hanmi Island. By 1715, both strike packages had completed their work and were homeward bound for Tycho. The strikes were finished. As the fires burned out ashore and the planes were covered aboard their ships, each side tallied the damage given and received. The Vim Petroleum facility was 90% destroyed, seven patrol boats destroyed, 10 severely damaged, 16 others damaged to some degree. Two Connie aircraft had been shot down. One pilot, Richard Sather, was declared killed in action. The other, Everett Alvarez, was presumed to have survived ejection, but his exact status was not immediately known. Two days later, on August 7th, the U.S. Congress passed the Tonkin Gulf Resolution. On the same day, North Vietnamese pilots flew 36 MiG-15s and MiG-17s to Fukien near Hanoi. And from then on, there will be a legitimate air-to-air threat for U.S. aviators. Surface air missiles, SAMs, would not appear for a while yet. As the ashes cooled in Vin, the sailors on the carriers couldn't know it, but they would have their own deadly fires to deal with in the future. For now, Yankee team missions over Laos continued, as did support missions for DeSoto patrols. There would be a period of months before the next major strike on North Vietnam, but in a telling statistic demonstrating the inherently dangerous nature of flying off aircraft carriers, Task Force 77 would lose 11 aircraft and 7 pilots during the short non-combat period from August 6th to the end of December. Yet, this would be seen as a lull in the action. For more conflict was to come, and the environment would be more hazardous than anyone could imagine.